Greetings in Jesus. If you don't know me, you're not missing very much, but my name is Jacob Prash. I wish I could be with you in Tempe, but unfortunately I had to return to the UK, to Great Britain where I live. <clears throat> and therefore, we sent representatives in my place, in the place of our ministry, Moriel. But my thanks, of course, to Pastor John Higgins and to Paul Smith and to David Hawking and others for organizing this event and others similar to it. I think these meetings are important and will become increasingly important if Calvary Chapel is to have much of a future. I was a friend of Chuck Smith. I shared platforms with him. I did conferences with him. I liked him very much personally. I had a high regard for Chuck. It was because of my high personal regard for Chuck, I refrained from saying certain things publicly when he was still with us. Now, however, Brother Chuck is with the Lord, and certain things now must be said and said publicly. I'm going to be perfectly blunt and honest. I know a number of Calvary Chapel ministers in different countries, as far away as Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, the United States, of course, and elsewhere, even Israel. And I knew Chuck Smith. I've shared platforms with him, befriended him, always liked him personally and admired his ministry and the way God used him. But I was never part of the Calvary system, even though I attended a Calvary chapel. Therefore, I'm not colored by any particular brush or influence. I can just speak directly and candidly. In the history of the church, at any one time, there seemed to be a particular movement that God blessed and used the most. In the early part of the 20th century, it was early Pentecostalism. Although it went off the rails in certain respects, other people came along and put grain into the proverbial toxic stew, and God blessed movements such as the Assemblies of God. We can go back to the previous 19th century. In the second half of that century, God blessed the Plymouth Brethren Movement. In the 18th century, God blessed and used the Methodists of John Wesley and George Whitfield. We can go all the way back to the ancient church, to the Novatians, to the Waldensians, to the Bohemian Brethren, to other groups at different times. I believed at one time that Calvary Chapel actually had the potential of being the main group that God would use in the 21st century. I believe it had the potential to do that spiritually and doctrinally. But I've got to be honest. Now that Pastor Chuck Smith is with the Lord, and in light of certain events that transpired even before he went to be with the Lord, I have grave doubts as to the future of the Calvary Chapel movement in its present form. There are many good people, many good churches, many good pastors. But there has been a definite trend away from the original emphasis and doctrines that Chuck Smith had always taught. A definite trend. In fact, there's a definite trend away from scriptural evangelicism. It's a subject addressed by Chuck's brother, my friend Paul Smith, in this book, The New Evangelicism. I profoundly wish every Calvary Chapel pastor would read this book and take it to heart seriously. Paul blatantly and directly, without compromise, addresses a number of issues that are confronting the church today, including Calvary chapels, dragging it away from its biblical foundation. I'm speaking of things like the emergent church, certainly things like the purpose-driven agenda and other such trends. Some people refer to these things as a paradigm shift, a redefinition of biblical Christianity. Call it what you will, we live in an age of apostasy, an age of decline. Calvary Chapel could have and should have been a beacon of light at a time of growing darkness. But now, the light is going out in many Calvary chapels. Not all of them, but many of them. In the earlier stages of Calvary's development, Chuck Smith, although a gracious man and very reluctant to confront would confront when he had to. Let's be honest. When Lonnie Frisbee went off the walls, Chuck got rid of him. When John Wimber went off the wall, Chuck got rid of him. All the way into his old age, 
when one of Chuck's sons began to embrace emergence. Chuck again took a stand, putting loyalty to the word of God even before a family loyalty, and he loved his family. I always respected and valued those things about Chuck. He used to say, I'd rather err on the side of grace. But at least he reached a point where he realized that error had nothing to do with grace when the error was not corrected. But as his health and his age and the effects of these things on his family and on his dear wife, who had her own problems medically and with Alzheimer's, began to almost envelop Chuck. We witnessed people whose motives were sometimes less than honorable, manipulating him, trying to use him for their own agenda. Things happened that never would have happened when Chuck was younger and healthier. He was manipulated. I did a conference with Chuck Smith and I spoke directly about the dangers of the purpose-driven agenda, how unscriptural it was, where it was coming from. Chuck agreed with everything. He applauded my remarks. But it wasn't long after that until he appeared with Rick Warren in Anaheim Stadium. I know for a fact Chuck did not agree with the purpose-driven agenda. He was old. He was sick. His wife's health was failing. He was a man under a lot of pressure. He said and did things that he would not have done in better times. He should have been cared for like an aged father. Instead, there were people who manipulated him for their own self-aggrandizing aims. I'm telling you the truth. Paul Smith in his book, faces facts for what they are. He's not the only one. Dave Hunt did much the same. But right now, who is facing the facts within the Calvary movement? Calvary Chapel was held together by the legacy and image of Chuck Smith. Now he's with Jesus. What is going to hold it together now? A movement can only be held together by common doctrine, one faith, one baptism. When you have people who believe the same things, who are committed to the same scriptural principles, that will have unity of the Spirit. But once that's no longer the case, another kind of unity comes into play. I saw this happen in the Assemblies of God 25 years ago. And those same trends I saw destroy the Assemblies of God, theologically and spiritually, are now coming into Calvary chapels. When you have the unity of the Spirit, you don't need a hierarchy. You don't need a unity based on financial considerations, property trusts. You don't need to denominationalize. All you need is a fellowship of fellowships. But once the unity of the Spirit is gone, you see movements beginning to amalgamate along administrative lines. They begin to use financial considerations, theocratic politics. That becomes the basis of unity, not common doctrine, not a common goal, not a common vision. It becomes more hierarchical, more controlled by the purse, more controlled by priorities that are not God's. This has already begun in Calvary Chapel. I'm being direct. I'm attempting to speak the truth in love with animosity towards no one but the devil. One example. Let's look at harvest. Yes, harvest. Jesus never said, never did he say to make converts. He said to make disciples. Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Converts fall away. Disciples stand. When you lead people to Christ and put them into dodgy churches with wrong doctrines, I don't mean secondary doctrinal issues we can all disagree on. I mean fundamental doctrines. 
when you put people who are newly saved into those churches. This is what Jesus warned of in Matthew 23 when he said the Pharisees went to the ends of the earth to make one convert, one proselyte, and what became of them? Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Evangelists with good intention want to see people get saved. We can all say amen to that. But saved into what? There is no scriptural basis whatsoever to separate evangelism from discipleship. Leading people to Christ and putting them in dodgy churches is not of God. When you get in bed with a man like Rick Warren, who has a global peace plan, where he says publicly, it doesn't matter what God you have faith in, we need to unite with people of faith even if we don't agree with them. And he has his peace plan, P, partnering with Hindus, with Muslims, with Buddhists, with Mormons. What happened to I am the Lord your God? You'll have no gods before me. Moses made it clear other gods are demons. Shadim in Hebrew. Paul said other gods are demons. The monoi in Greek were to unite with demon worshippers to bring in global peace. This is an antichrist agenda and I'm not exaggerating. Calvary Chapel always emphasized the place of prophecy of Israel, events in the Middle East. That was always a hallmark of Calvary and of Chuck's ministry. There's been an erosion from it. You've had replacement theology people infiltrating into Calvary's. Less and less emphasis on prophecy following people like Mark Driscoll who mock Christians, who study it, who belittles them, who stereotypes them all as conspiracy theorists obsessed with the Illuminati, or Rick Warren, who in direct defiance of the clear and unmitigated instruction of Jesus teaches to avoid end-time prophecy, it's a diversion. Jesus said, be alert, watch for these events in the Olivet Discourse. Rick Warren says, keep away from it. You either believe Jesus Christ or you believe Rick Warren. You cannot believe both. It is a shame and a disgrace for any Calvary pastor, any Calvary pastor to align themselves with such error and deception. These are indeed the last days. I must wonder, are the people who are doing this really building the kingdom of God or the mere empires of men? The reason God blessed Calvary is that Chuck was not out to build his kingdom. He was out to build God's. Something has gone wrong. There is a doctrinal erosion away from the original doctrinal emphasis of Calvary chapels. I don't mean on secondary issues. I mean on primary issues. You have youth with the mission. Openly teaching you can call Jesus, Io, the name of the Hawaiian volcano god, before missionaries arrived in Hawaii, they were throwing infant babies into the volcano to stop the lava flows to placate Eo. Now that's Jesus. Danny Lehman teaches in Calvary chapels with the blessing of Calvary pastors. This is sick. We have people teaching Chrislam. Talked to people saved out of Islam. I lived in the Middle East for nine years. I know what Islam really is. Allah is not the God of Christians and Jews. He's the Nabataean moon god, a demon idol. There's not a single Islamic country in the world that will give Christians the rights that Muslims demand in Western countries. Chrislam, interfaith, ecumenism. Where will it end? Now, I know there's a number of Calvary pastors who privately agree with myself. There are Calvary pastors who privately agreed with our brother Dave Hunt. There are Calvary pastors who privately agreed with Paul Smith. There are ones who privately agree. It is time for them to stand up and publicly agree and say, we are not going along with this. 
There's something I didn't say publicly because of my respect for Chuck, but I will say it now. A number of years ago, nearly 10 years ago, I'd been praying for Chuck when his health first began to take a tip. And I was praying for the future of Calvary Chapels. This is what I stand by. I believe the Lord showed me at that time. You weigh it, you judge it. Chuck is in the character, he was in the character of Eli the priest in the book of Samuel. A godly man. But a godly man who because of age began to lose his sight. And his sons went off. Now, I'm not necessarily speaking of biological sons. I'm speaking of sons in the ministry. His sons went off. He knew it. But he was too old and too frail to correct them before it was too late. The light had not yet gone out, but there was a problem. It was flickering. Well, now in Calvary, the light they had is flickering just like the church in Ephesus. It had a lamp, but it was going to be removed. The next generation after Chuck contains people who are following the example they always had, but others who have deviated. Now let me express my personal appreciation and respect for people like John Higgins, obviously for Paul Smith, for Jack Hibbs, for a number of Calvary preachers, Mike McIntosh, I respect all of these men. I respect Pancho Juarez. I respect many of these men. I like Lloyd Pulley. I like what Joe Foch does. I like what, what Bill does in upstate New York. But there are other problems. There are other people among Chuck's sons who have gone the way of the sons of Eli. They are no longer following Scripture. They have an agenda that is not from God. What can be done? God raised up a Samuel, somebody who was from outside the family. God bless Chuck. But nepotism morphs into disaster somehow. There must be somebody or some leaders who are not part of any family loyalty, whose loyalty is only to the word of God, who are not colored by it. This is imperative. I know Chuck taught the Moses principle. You can agree with it or disagree with it as a model of ecclesiastical polity. Personally, I believe the plurality of elders is the norm. But even taking the Moses principle, one of the ingredients, hallmarks of the Moses principle is that you groom a Joshua. Once Moses went, everybody knew Joshua was going to take over. There is a leadership vacuum in Calvary Chapel. The Moses principle was not followed. There is no Joshua. There is, however, a Holy Spirit. My appeal is to my friends and my brothers in the Calvary ministry, those who bear witness with what I'm saying, even if you don't think much of me, that doesn't matter. Read Paul's book. You people need to stand up and unite and to seek the Lord for a way forward. The only way to stop gangrene sometimes is amputation. The only way to stop an aggressively metastatic cancer sometimes is amputation. A split of some kind is going to become inevitable in Calvary's. You cannot long-term hold the movement together based on 
considerations of property, trust, and finance, it will eventually cave in the way the Church of England is doing. What is a denomination? A superannuation fund for ministers and a tax-exempt property trust. That's what a denomination is. That's all it really is. It may carry on its business and its legal and financial interests under the guise of religion, but all it is is a superannuation fund and a property trust with a cross on the roof. God forbid that that's the way Calvary Chapel shall end up. But many, many other movements who God has blessed and used in times past have ended up just that way. And if something doesn't happen soon, that is the way Calvary Chapel is going to end up. God bless. Heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you the overseers, that you feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. And this is the charge and the responsibility that God has placed upon the ministers to feed the flock of God. But it is so difficult to find pastors today who will really feed the flock of God. We get letters by the hundreds the other night when I was in Indianapolis, scores of people afterwards said to me, would you please start a work here in Indianapolis? We've been praying for five years that God would establish a Calvary Chapel here in Indianapolis. We want a place where we can just go and be fed the Word of God. People are hungry to be fed the Word of God. And so Paul said, to these overseers of the church at Ephesus. Feed the flock of God. Peter, in writing his epistles, said, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Jesus said to Peter, Feed my sheep. I don't know why pastors don't realize that this is the most important function of a pastor is to feed the flock of God. We have those who are seeking to entertain the flock of God. And then, God help us, unfortunately, we have those who are seeking to fleece the flock of God. But how few are really feeding the flock of God. Also of your own selves. For I know this, the reason why to feed them is in that they might become strong. Because wolves are going to come in. After I depart, Grievous wolves are going to enter in among you, not sparing the flock. False doctrines that will come in. Weird concepts and ideas. Men who will try to draw groups after themselves. There's always that. God establishes a work. And then there are always those who try and come in. Even out of your own midst, there will come those that will try and break off a group to bring them as after themselves. Sad and tragic. The greatest burden on the heart of Paul, the greatest grief and sorrow, were those men who would come in to prey upon the flock of God, to draw men after themselves. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make thee. His face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee.